Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all so much for joining us here today. Um, we're uh, sorry for the, the late start. We're just a couple of minutes uh, to allow some people to enter. Um, so I might get started then. So my name is Marina. I am the webinar coordinator for Evidence Synthesis Ireland. And we're delighted to welcome you all to our summer Evidence Synthesis Ireland webinar series. And we're delighted today to co-host this webinar with the Health Research Board Primary Care Clinical Trial Network of Ireland. So just by way of brief introduction, for those of you who may not know, um, Evidence Census Ireland includes Cochrane Ireland, is an all-Ireland initiative funded by the Health Research Board and the Research and Development Division of Public Health Agency in Northern Ireland. Our aim is to build evidence census knowledge, awareness and capacity on the island of Ireland, and we have a number of key activities for achieving that aim, and one of them is a monthly webinar on an evidence synthesis topic. Our presenter for today, who we are absolutely delighted to have, is Dr. Nancy Santesso. So Nancy is on the line, but before I hand over, I'll just briefly introduce her. Um, Dr. Santesso is an assistant professor in the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact at Mac McMaster University of Canada. She is also a registered dietitian. She's been a strong supporter of the Cochrane Collaboration since 2002 and is currently the Deputy Director of Cochrane Ireland and the Editor of Cochrane Consumers and Communication Review Group. She has provided training in Cochrane Systematic Reviews for more than a decade. Nancy is also a member of the GRADE Working Group, a group dedicated to the rigorous development of clinical practice guidelines and the use of evidence from systematic reviews in guidelines. She has trained guideline developers and facilitated guideline panel meetings using the GRADE approach for the World Health Organization and other professional organizations, both nationally and internationally. Her research interests include the engagement of patients and public in the evidence synthesis and use, and the communication of evidence to patients and the public as plain language summaries of systematic reviews and patient versions of guidelines. So before I hand over to Nancy, uh, today, our question and answer session will be a little bit different and um, it will be on a rolling basis. So I suppose ongoing throughout the webinar. So we do encourage for you to submit your questions to the Q&A box. Hopefully you can all see it uh, down below. Uh, so please do type in your questions and then our um, panelists will, and will monitor them. And then Nancy will answer them as we go along during the presentation. Um, so we've also turned off video to ensure there's good sound quality for, for all our at attendees. Um, so I'll stop talking for now and um, I'm delighted to, to welcome Nancy. So Nancy, thank you so much. And I might hand over to you until we have some questions and then I'll, I'll feed those back in. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Um, so thanks for the invitation and um, I'm super excited to um, just uh, communicate a little bit about uh, what we've been doing um, and um, some of our efforts and strategies for engaging key stakeholders in evidence synthesis. And um, I will speak to you, I have, I've have some experience with um, Cochrane and systematic reviews and systematic reviews in general. And um, I also have uh, some experience with guidelines and um, helping groups uh, produce guidelines and um, helping with uh, and facilitating engagement of key stakeholders also in uh, guidelines. Um, so one of my, my first uh, questions, and we'll just make sure that see if people have, um, they're okay with their abilities to um, navigate through Zoom, um, is one of the questions I had for people is whether, um, I think would assume that people are, uh, using and doing systematic reviews. Um, but I also just wanted to know if there are people on the line that are also doing uh, guideline development. And um, maybe we could try with people and see if they can raise their hand. I think people would have that function um, to be able to raise their hand. But if, if some people can, um, then we would actually be able to see um, if people are having some experience uh, with clinical practice guidelines or producing guidelines, um, and also thinking about whether you've already been engaging consumers and, and other key stakeholders in that process. And as we said, um, we'll definitely be pausing every once in a while during the, um, the presentation. So if you do have any questions, 
um, et cetera, please um, list them in the question and answer section uh, box um, and we'll try and answer them throughout. Um, and happy to answer any, any questions that you have. Okay, great. Um, so the one where I'd like to start is just in a general, because we will come back to this obviously throughout the presentation is, uh, we do have a, a general process for evidence synthesis and the reason I, I'm going to set this out is because there are multiple points that we can um, engage consumers and key stakeholders into that process. And, um, you know, generally with the evidence synthesis process, we're starting with defining the question. Um, we're then spending time developing protocols and planning our uh, systematic review. Um, just deciding what's, what studies would be eligible in that systematic review. Um, then we start the, the process with searching for the studies, um, screening through all of the studies to see which studies are, should be included in the systematic review, collecting that data, assessing the studies for risk of bias, um, then analyzing and synthesizing all those results, whether it's using a statistical analysis or a narrative synthesis uh, when statistical um, pooling is not possible. And then um, presenting and um, assessing the evidence. Um, so using grade and, and obviously that's a really um, big part of what I do is how to grade the evidence. And then once the evidence has been graded, um, interpreting those results, drawing conclusions, and writing it up. And of course, this whole process uh, re, uh, repeats when we do update our these evidence uh, syntheses. So that's the evidence syntheses part. And then I'll just touch on briefly um, what are, is the process that we see with guideline development. And here is a diagram as well. Um, I think, you know, if we focus mostly on that middle part, um, a lot of that first part is similar to what we would do in an evidence synthesis um, process. So we're, again, we're setting priorities, we're deciding what our questions are, um, summarizing the evidence, synthesizing about effects, we're um, judging the, the evidence, assessing that evidence, and presenting that evidence to a guideline panel, typically, to then uh, make or develop recommendations, um, then moving into writing, um, just as we did for evidence synthesis. And then there is, in both processes, there will be this peer review process or external review of our conclusions or recommendations and dissemination. And again, going back and updating um, that guideline, just as similar as we would update the evidence reviews. Um, so the processes are quite similar and a lot of the part of the uh, guideline development process does include that evidence synthesis as well. So just to uh, sort of put us on task of what we're focusing on here. Um, so when asked to do this presentation um, and webinar, um, I reached back into when I started working with the Cochrane uh, collaboration and it was back in 2002 and at the time I was working with um, the Cochrane musculoskeletal group and they had already started um, involving consumers in their process so they had focused on one group of uh, stakeholder um, so consumers, the patient, uh, patients, the public. And we had, uh, along with Bev Shea, had written this paper about how to include consumers and other stakeholders in the process of systematic reviews. Um, and they had started back in 1993 about how to do that. And the interesting thing was, is when I went back to this paper, um, many, they, the paper does go through some of the key principles that we were using um, back in that, uh, in 2005. And um, some of the key principles were around and really have not changed um, today. There, there really are the basis of, of some of the key um, principles that we need to think about when uh, involving stakeholders. So um, establishing roles of those key stakeholders, um, 
in particular, what are our responsibilities when we are involving key stakeholders? And um, always, you know, what would be the challenges that we may face and what, what we could um, do to overcome those challenges? Um, so it's not a new concept. And um, of course, I think today we've become a bit more deliberate in what we're doing. And I'm hoping in this webinar to just give a few uh, practical, uh, but, but steps, first steps also, um, and probably in sometimes reminders to those of you who may already be involving consumers um, and other key stakeholders um, about you know, different processes that you can do. Um, and they, I think even today, they're becoming a bit more specific um, because we do, we are working with limited time and resources. Um, so we do have to make some decisions about what we would like to do and um, target uh, specific groups as well. So I'll build on some of the work back from back then. Um, just to say that we will focus on that. Um, so one of the first thing, first points, um, and there's a lot of literature out there, and I will just pull from some work um, from multiple groups during the uh, webinar about um, starting out with deciding who are the stakeholders that you would like to include. And as I said, with the Cochrane Muscle Skeletal Group, we had decided that it was super important to spend time and resources on involving consumers. Um, and there are a variety across the literature of how to identify who you might uh, include as your key stakeholders. And typically, um, we are focus on, focusing on people who would be affected by whatever evidence we are creating or whatever decisions we're making in our, uh, for example, in guidelines. And you may have heard of it already, but um, a lot of there has been a lot of research where they actually focused on the P's of who you would include. And so they list out all the different P's um, and the, all the different key stakeholders. Um, so generally, a lot of times, immediately we might think about patients and the public. Uh, we also have providers or clinicians that we would include, um, any, any healthcare provider. Um, policymakers is, is another large group that we have a, a bit of literature around of how to include them in the, um, the evidence synthesis process and decision making um, arena. Um, principal investigators, so focusing on researchers and uh, of course typically we, it was, that was, you know, in the past that was the, the group that we um, focused on was communicating to other researchers. Um, we also have, they've identified purchasers and payers, um, product makers, so focusing also on, on industry. Um, but again, I've pulled this and the P's, I guess, are quite common across the literature. Um, but we also have, in particular, if you're focusing on um, work that's being done in Cochrane, um, through the knowledge translation strategy, there, we have identified four key uh, stakeholders. Um, that can be included. And uh, the interesting thing about the literature is that um, no matter how you classify it, whether you use the P's or these, these um, icons for four uh, pillars, um, they, in some ways, they're all quite similar. Um, so you can see here again, consumers in the public, uh, practitioners, providers, policymakers, healthcare managers, um, and again, the researchers and research funders. Um, so a lot of, there are a lot of key stakeholders that we can focus on, which can be quite overwhelming. And so the question often is, is how do we decide which stakeholder we are going to focus on? Um, because again, we are working within limited time and resources. Um, so one of the main reasons we might focus on a specific group is uh, we're thinking about the potential results and applicability of the work or the synthesis or decisions um, that we're making. Um, and you would go back to and ask yourself, you know, who, who, who would be the most important person we want to target with this or, and who would actually uh, benefit from um, knowing about this. Um, and again, who you decide on can be quite different um, and it could be quite focused. Uh, for example, you know, I, we, I, we, I've been quite involved with um, developing 
cervical cancer screening program, um, screening uh, recommendations. And in particular, um, we, I was working with the World Health Organization to, de to determine and um, uh, highlight what are the key recommendations for um, screening and what tests should be used um, in different programs um, and what treatments should be used in different programs. And for the World Health Organization in particular for this guideline, we had conducted some systematic reviews. And during that process, one of the key stakeholders that we decided to include were uh, program managers. And really it was because the recommendations as worded and uh, that we had made, they could have been applicable to many different stakeholders. So individual patients, um, uh, clinicians, um, uh, policymakers, um, but for us, the key stakeholder that could be needed to be involved was uh, program managers because we felt that these results would be very applicable to them and relevant. Um, the other reasons and what you might think of when deciding on your key stakeholders um, can really be focused on, um, again, time and resources. Um, so there is that ideal situation, you know, it want, you want it to be potentially re relevant to them. Um, but you may say to yourself, I already have a network of people that um, I can work with. And so I'm going to focus on sort of the, the low hanging fruit. And that can be um, one really valid reason for why you would focus on a specific key stakeholder. And um, it can really make sense uh, when funding um, might be limited in time and resources. Um, and you may also, if you are funded by a certain body, um, it may be mandated by that funder on who you should be involving. Um, and that's another reason why you might uh, focus on a specific key stakeholder. And then the other um, uh, point that I really wanted to make was um, what evidence is available and I just wanted to go into what I really meant by what evidence is available. And I go back to the first part is, you know, what is the reason that we want to engage specific stakeholders? And um, that rationale I've just pulled out of some work that's really coming out of um, a consortium that is looking at um, the involvement and engagement and the research around engaging um, different stakeholders and which is the MUSE consortium. And what I did is I just pulled out some um, why they, they list out what is your rationale for involving people in the process of evidence synthesis. And they note that one of the most important issues is to involve stakeholders um, to be able to make study questions more relevant um, the methods and approaches of your review or guidelines more transparent, um, ensuring that the findings are more useful, um, and that the evidence is more likely to be used in practice. Um, so that knowledge translation part. Um, so given that that's the reason that you would want to engage stakeholders in that process, um, then what we can see is that that last part, that those reasons, there may be ways that we can do this. And I think we can um, think about different strategies for how we could make our research more relevant, more transparent, more useful, and more used in practice. So there are different ways that we can do this. And as I mentioned before, we can focus on these different points during the process of evidence synthesis. And if we think about that process, um, we can highlight different areas where we would say that we would want to include um, the perspectives of different stakeholders. So for example, we would focus on, um, you know, what are the priority questions for those stakeholders? Um, what are the outcomes? So if we think about our PICO question, so um, what are, are the, the components of our uh, question, um, which outcomes are relevant, so what, what would they want to see, what do they want to know about that, the effects of an intervention, for example. Um, 
you might want to, when you're doing your analysis, focus on certain subgroups because they're important. Those subgroups are important in your uh, country, in your region, uh, your local setting. Um, so that was where you would, might want some feedback. Um, and you'll probably want some feedback about how to interpret the results. And then I'll give some examples for that. And how can I clearly communicate these to that stakeholder group? So there are many points where you can in, engage um, different stakeholders. Um, but uh, it may not necessarily be a, an engagement. Um, it, what is important though, however, would be how could I obtain the perspectives of those stakeholders? Because ultimately that is the reason why we're trying to engage uh, stakeholders in that process. And I might just pause here before I go on just to see if we do have any questions or clarifications or comments for some of the, the uh, participants. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Nancy. Um, we just have a question here. Um, have you ever found the limits of time and resources have led to reduced consumer involvement or do you see the consumer involvement as being essential? Uh, yes, and, and I think, you know, as I go on, I think I will, um, there is certainly a balance and I, uh, what, what I wanted to talk about in the next section was, um, if you don't have the time and resources to be able to um, engage uh, people in that process, you may find other ways to include their perspectives so that you can try to make them make your work uh, very relevant and useful. Perfect. Thank you, Nancy. Um, we just have another one um, going back to the guideline development process, I suppose. Mm. Um, what, what trainings would you say are required to be involved in guideline development? So I'm thinking is that uh, I think I'm thinking about the question about um, uh, training for the stakeholders to be involved in that guideline development process is that I, I think I'll, I'll kind of jump off from there. Um, we, we're definitely, it's a really great question because we are, um, you know, our group actually at McMaster and in the Guideline uh, International Network, uh, putting together um, uh, uh, modules to help people be involved in the process. And so there are a couple modules that will focus specifically on certain stakeholders and how, what background information and skills do they need to be involved in that process. Um, and at the end of the, um, the presentation, I also have a, a short list of um, information and um, modules um, that we would think that might be helpful for uh, people to be involved in the evidence synthesis process. Um, so I think that's a great question. We're, we're always asked about, um, you know, do we require that people are trained um, to be able to participate? And I'll, I'll um, I, I believe yes. Um, and um, I'll just, we can, I have a list at the end of the um, presentation about some resources that might be helpful. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nancy. Okay, great. So, um, you know, as the, the first question was, you know, what, when, what could happen if you are balancing those time and resources? Um, and you may identify that um, in some cases it might be, uh, it might involve a lot of time to be able to involve stakeholders, um, individual stakeholders in that process. Um, so other ways that you can obtain and, you know, you can include people actually as, uh, as part of, of your group and you can consult with a separate group um, during the process. Um, but I wanted to focus on these last two parts. Um, we definitely have building literature, um, expanding literature around um, the perspectives of uh, different stakeholder groups. And it's published literature that's out there. And um, it could be, for example, a survey of uh, policymakers about what are the key uh, top uh, issues that are relevant today that they would need um, information and evidence about. Um, so when people will conduct those surveys and publish those. Um, there may be interviews um, or focus groups with, for example, uh, patients and the public around what is a value to them. What, what if they were uh, had, uh, for example, 
um, osteoarthritis? Um, would they, what would they want to see? Um, what types of effective interventions would they want to see? And what would mean to them effective? Um, so really pointing at, you know, they would ask them, you know, what sort of outcomes would you like to see? Well, I would like to see reduced pain, etc. cetera. Um, so we do have building amounts of literature that are already asking stakeholders for their perspectives um, and interpretations. Um, and I will give some examples, um, but I think that's one option is that if you are um, in a situation where you might not have the time and resources to involve um, individuals in the process, you may focus on looking for the literature that may already be um, published. If there is no literature, then that's when you would say, I, we definitely need to, we need to have resources to be able to involve people in this process because we don't have any other information that we can rely on. And I just listed a couple uh, places where you could um, look for this information. Um, comment, uh, they've already pulled together in a large database, what are the important outcomes? So any literature around the important, the value that people place on outcomes, the most important outcomes that should be looked at in research. Um, so if you're conducting your systematic review, you would go to, for example, the Comet database and type in osteoarthritis. And you would be able to see a list of very, uh, you know, the top outcomes and relevant outcomes that uh, should be included in your evidence synthesis or in when you're making guidelines. What are those outcomes that should be considered when making that decision? And again, if that evidence is available there, you may decide that I don't need to involve um, uh, stakeholders in that, pro that point of doing my evidence synthesis. Um, and this is just one example. Um, I have another example. Um, many times in that process of uh, doing systematic reviews and um, uh, clinical practice guidelines, you will also need to probably answer, you know, what is an important effect? So yes, we looked at pain, we looked at hospital anxiety, for example, uh, when determining whether this intervention could work for people who have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, I want to know if we find a difference of uh, that hospital anxiety is reduced by 10 points on a scale of 0 to 100, is that going to be meaningful to patients? Um, if I find that um, uh, when implementing this program, that coverage of cervical screening increases by 10%. Is that going to be important to program managers out there? Um, so we may have some information around what are the differences or effects that are important to key stakeholders? And that might already be in the literature. Um, and if so, we may not need to involve uh, stakeholders in that part of the uh, evidence synthesis or the clinical practice guideline. Um, so these are just two quick examples, um, but there is, you know, I think a lot of times we can decide, let's look at the literature first to see what's out there. If we have a lot of literature for uh, important perspectives from our key stakeholders, then we may not need to involve them in that stage. And we could focus on another part of the process where we need some better feedback. And so basically that is what I meant by evidence synthesis and what could be possibly ava available. If you don't find that there is any evidence out there, um, this is where you would start to think about how is it that we're going to engage key stakeholders in that process. And I'm taking from some very old, you know, not very old, but you know, literature back in 2004 where they outlined different ways that we can um, uh, involve people. And we folk, the, we've at this point thought of, you know, how do we consult with stakeholders? So whether it's consulting through the literature or consulting with them um, in person. And the, so we, many times we think of this consultation part, but also part of the, this hierarchy of how to include um, stakeholders is collaboration. So we may actually have people involved as an author of a review, of a systematic review, or as part of the committee 
um, for example, when doing a guideline, uh, doing a guideline, you would have those stakeholders on your guideline panel who are making those decisions. And then finally, they had identified where the uh, consumer, the stakeholder, is in is actually leading the research um, and may consult with, you know, in the opposite way, they would consult with the professionals. Um, so it definitely a flip there. Um, so we focused on the consultation, but also collaboration is another um, step in that in in how to engage uh, different stakeholders. Um, and again, in consultation, that's where we thought we can consult with the literature. Um, so when I started out, I used I used to work uh, quite closely with our uh, one of our consumer advocates in the Cochrane Muscle Salido group, and I remember one of the first things that she said to me was. Um, when engaging with key stakeholders is you need to give people a, a task um, and so that's how they will feel that they're they're contributing and that's how we will actually um, have information so many times um, and I've heard in other webinars where um, just chatting with people is not enough um, and one of the key things is to provide a, a, a task a concrete task uh, for who uh, your stakeholders to do um, and so again, I point to how can we uh, engage people and give them a concrete task. So I'll focus on the first one, which is uh, priority, determining what are the questions, uh, which types of reviews we should do, or even which recommendations should we focus on doing. And one way to really involve key stakeholders that we have done is actually sending out um, a survey to stakeholders that we have involved in the process and asking them what are the most important questions that we need to ask. Um, and I just, you know, it can be any type of uh, survey or provided. We happen to work through our Grade Pro software, um, but you can use SurveyMonkey. Um, but it's a very practical way and a, a task that people um, will feel that they're being engaged in that process of. Um, deciding what are the questions that should be answered in your systematic review. So priority setting. So right from the beginning, uh, what should we be looking at? And I haven't shown it here, but other parts of that would be, you know, what are the key populations that we should be looking at in our systematic review, which would might decide on the subgroups. Same thing for clinical practice guidelines. Um, what interventions should we be focusing on? So in this case, it was an allergy um a guideline and so they said you know what what would you like to focus on and rate this from one as being a low priority to nine being a high priority and they had a whole list of different interventions um, to include so really focusing on that the p the, the i the intervention part and please prioritize these and people could also provide comments about those um, and at the end of the day, whichever ones were rated more highly, that's what we would focus on or do a systematic review for. The other part of that question development, and we all, almost always do this and engage stakeholders in this process, is how to identify or what are the most important outcomes that we should look at. So with any evidence synthesis, you are identifying important outcomes. Um, there can be a number, you can, you can end up with 20 outcomes for an evidence synthesis or 20 outcomes for a synthesis that's being used in a guideline development process. And the key point would be going back to that, um, the key stakeholders and asking them, what are the most important outcomes we should look at? Um, and again, ranking from one lowest priority to nine priority, and then what are some other comments? And do you have any additional outcomes that you think that we've missed that should be included? So again, a really concrete task that any of your stakeholders can do in that process. And it, it can be uh, something that is totally done online and you're engaging your groups that way. And if it happens when you, for example, look at the, the safe, um, the the breadth of the responses. Um, I just kind of cut and pasted one here where we asked, um, you know, this is just showing five people, um, what are the important outcomes? And this one happened to be around um, osteoporosis. 
um, and we ask them to rate them. And then we're basically pulling all together those ratings and then asking and then coming up with a, 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 a mean a score for what would be important to include in our reviews. Um, so very simple, can be done electronically, could be done by email, um, it could be done on a conference call. Uh, please rank these. And for example, if you do end up, say for that last one, the adverse events, we have quite a large span. So someone has marked it as pretty low priority four. Another individual has marked it as nine. Um, and to, in order to um, decide whether we should include that outcome, you may have a conference call to, to discuss why there's so much variability and um, have a, a final uh, decision about what outcomes you'll include just by a conference call. But something again very concrete for people to do. Another part of that process that you can involve um, key stakeholders in is this interpreting the results. So I've just highlighted it there. When we're writing systematic reviews we do need to think about and be able to interpret and uh, present those results. Um, so I just again gave an example where um, if you did do a review um, and you found that there was, you know, you're moderately certain that the effect you found was that it reduces the number of fractures by four out of 1,000. So anyone who takes vitamin D will have four fewer fractures out of 1,000 people. Um, and when you're writing a review, even if it's for a guideline or for publication, um, what would you say? What kind of conclusions would you make based on that number four? Um, you might say, you know, it probably reduces fractures slightly. And that's if someone thought that four is not really a, a, an important uh, benefit, um, but, you know, it's a slight reduction. Um, you might say, and depending on who, what the stakeholders in, say, um, you might say it likely results in a large reduction in fractures. Um, or, depending on what your stakeholders say, it probably makes little or no difference in fractures. Um, so interpreting those results and presenting those results will really be dependent on how important um, those fractures are seen as. Um, so that, for us, is a really important part of the uh, evidence synthesis um, process to be of where we would involve stakeholders because we want to know from them what do you see as being an important effect. Um, so we have a really great opportunity to ask them about this and involve them in those decisions and consult with them. And I just pulled that this from the chapter 15 in the Cochrane Handbook. Um, the other part was the you know we focused on co consultation um, but there's also a, other part parts where we can do collaboration. And um, again, it, it, we really can focus on um, involving those stakeholders in that, pro, in that process. Um, and we have been seeing that actually, that um, many people, you know, again, we give them a task and can be in, in that process. And ex for example, there are many tasks where we thought traditionally that key stakeholders would not want to be involved in. So if I back up, we have this list here, um, and you'll notice that I skipped all, this, all the steps in between. And because we traditionally wouldn't think that people would want to be involved in data, abstracting data from studies or, or screening studies. Um, but I think we've been proven wrong um, because we now see that a lot of people, a lot of stakeholders are involved in the Cochrane crowd where they're screening through multiple uh, articles to see if they're actually randomized control trials. And there are huge numbers of people that are contributing to that effort on Cochrane Crowd. Um, so I think we have to also think that traditionally we might think that there are certain points in the systematic review process that we think people would want to be involved. Um, and I think we just need to ch change our, our, our ideas that it's only in these, these steps um, that there are other steps that we, that stakeholders may want to be involved in. And so that's why, you know, involving people as an author on a review um, would not be a, a, um, so different. And in particular, very, very easily uh, identified when we are including people in guideline panels, 
um, that multiple stakeholders uh, can be involved in making those decisions about what are the recommendations and really balancing those benefits and harms and what is important. Again, going back to, do you see fractures, four fractures, a reduction of four fractures as important or not? Um, and all of that is based on judgment and is something that we would typically rely on a guideline panel to make those decisions around. Um, and I think one of the key things that I'm involved in is involving patients and consumers in clinical practice guidelines. And um, we had the question just earlier around, you know, what kind of training is necessary? And I've just pulled out one slide exactly from one of our training sessions with the patients and the public that we included in our guideline from the American Society of Hematology, uh, which was around blood clots, for example, and um, really clinical questions coming out of that recommendation. And the patients were a little bit, um, you know, overwhelmed, you know, how can we actually participate in a process with other clinicians? And, um, you know, we re really just broke it down. You know, you, you can help with making decisions around how large are the benefits and, you know, how large are these harms um, and how would you balance those? Um, do you think that it's expensive for patients to be able to access this medication? Um, how acceptable is it taking that medication and how feasible would it be for you to access that medication? Um, and really said to them that your expertise uh, will be valuable on that guideline panel, um, just as much as any clinician or other stakeholder on that panel. Um, so I think we do, yes, there is some sort of education. Many of it, many times it seems to be around um, making sure that it's not overwhelming and that um, uh, they really can also see their value. So as I said, there are multiple points that you can involve. Uh, many of the key stakeholders. Um, this may at first seem, it could be seen as a bit overwhelming, um, but there are certain very simple strategies that you could use, very targeted strategies to use. Um, I put up this quote, you know, around go big or go home. I think we're actually saying the opposite here. Um, time and resources can be limited, but there are, are simple um, simple strategies that you can use um, to target certain groups. Um, first of all, um, you know, we should give ourselves permission um, to target specific stakeholders. It's okay then to say to yourself, I'm just going to look at this key stakeholder. And I gave the, the, some of those reasons why you would only focus on a certain key stakeholder. Um, and, you know, basically saying that uh, you can focus on that, those low hanging fruit. Um, and you may already have some evidence available that you can include the perspectives without having to necessarily go to the step of including um, a sp uh, people on, on, in your uh, process. Um, and also I think that we can focus on very specific tasks that we can ask key st stakeholders this, so it doesn't seem overwhelming. This is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna send out um, some, you know, uh, a survey around what are the important outcomes. Um, and then this is how I'm going to start out with involving consumers in, in the evidence synthesis uh, uh, program that we have. Um, so I don't think go big or go home should be the way that we tackle engaging um, different key stakeholders. Um, and as I said, um, you know, basically I have listed some of these um, uh, resources already, um, but I did just put a small, it's a very short list just uh, for now um, of different resources, um, possibly focusing on different groups. I think in the Cochrane collaboration in the training section, we have an incredible number of modules um, for how to include people um, in different strategies. So they go through this priority setting of questions, outcome development. Um, there we have some, even through Cochrane, some very specific resources for consumers. Um, and as I mentioned, there already is this Muse consortium, so who's really looking and, and doing a lot of work right now. Um, there's PCORI, this patient-centered patient outcomes research in, in the States. And also if we're focusing on um, other stakeholders like um, uh, policymakers, for example, um, there are resources through the McMaster Health Forum as well. So just a short list, um, but definitely there are resources available out there. 
and I might just leave it here and see if we have any other questions. I hope our timing is going okay. Perfect, Nancy, thank you so much for that. That was really, really interesting, really applicable too. And it's great to see that the process of engagement, but also the challenges along the way and, and how that can be addressed. Um, and thank you everyone for sharing.